morning, all. Hi, Sue McCausland. Hi, Norma Bentley. Don Jones, good morning. Oh, everybody's jumping in here. Hard for me to keep up. Hi, Judy Martin. Barbara Wolf, good morning. Ken Woods, good morning. Hi, Barry and Margo. Paul Wolf, rain keep falling on my head. I talked about that song yesterday with someone. Hi, Scott Johnson. Kevin and Chris Vaughn, good morning. Hi, Aunt Mary. And Linda Clark and Linda Wolf and Tracy Crutz and Corey Lockridge, all good morning. Hi, Amy Bowerman. Joan Riggs, good morning. Larry and Carolyn Thomas. Carrie Van. Lynn, good morning to all. Good to see you all. It is a rainy, drizzly day. But what a beautiful day we had yesterday, huh? It was warm, very warm. And then um, I guess we're going to have some rain to tomorrow, too. Then it gets nicer, but cool. But cool. Marsha and Moe's, good morning to you. And hi, Nancy Sparks and Jolyn Ross. Hi. Up to 25 devices watching. So it's nice to be with you. Um, did not have, uh, had uh, Thursday and Friday off. So we had a great time. Meg and I went to, uh, drove down on Thursday to Washington, D.C. And we spent, uh, saw Chris Thursday night and then also all day on Friday. And then drove back up on Saturday. And uh, saw many of you on Warship yesterday. It was a very successful trip. We had a great time, and it was good to uh, good to get away. So, uh, hi Barbara. Oh, Barbara Wolf. Nice. Uh, yeah, I, on my Facebook page, you'll see. On one on our way back, we stopped at a place in West Virginia. We have this uh, metal porch furniture, this classic stuff. It was kind of really big, big in the 40s and 50s. And uh, gliders, Bunting was the name of the company. There were several companies, but Bunting was one of the bigger ones. So we have we have a three-person glider, and then we have one other chair, and it has uh, different patterns in the back. This is high crust. So we uh, we decided that we liked it, and I reconditioned those two, and then we found a place in West Virginia that actually sells them. And uh, so they go out and find it in uh, broken down places. And so. We got it, but now I have to recondition them. So a lot of wire brushing to remove surface rust and paint, and then I have to treat. Anyway, I did it. If you followed along, it was that was uh, doing the two pieces that we had last year was my um, pandemic uh, project. So I followed along. A lot of people liked it. I'm going to do the same thing. All right. Hi, Doug Goddard. Welcome back to Maple Heights. So Sandy Sauerbeck, hello. Hi, Robin Allen, Joy, and Steve Yamber are with us. Good to see you. So anyway, so watch my Facebook page. And if you don't, if you're not my friend on Facebook, just ask. I'll join. So um, all right, we are at 9:02, so we should get going with our uh, in, in those 30. 31 folks with us. So uh, since we weren't together um, uh, on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, um, the only thing that's really continuing on is uh, what we're seeing in our Old Testament. We were in Daniel. And if you remember, Daniel talks about King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the Babylonian king. Daniel had been taken up there. Well, now the lectionary has jumped over to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is a prophet that is in Judah at the same time that um, um, uh, at, when Nebuchadnezzar is laying siege under Jerusalem. So we'll hear about that. Okay. Uh, so that's what to expect. So don't worry about it. If you didn't follow along, we'll catch you up and, uh, and we'll move on from there. So I've got my uh, a cup way back on coffee. And so, but I, but I allow myself one Diet Coke in the morning. And I find by doing that, I cut my coffee consumption in half. 
which is a good thing probably, right? So, um, our lectionary readings together, we're gonna do this Monday, May 3rd. Wow, we're in May. And uh, we're gonna open up. Uh, so let God just invade us as we read his word and let, uh, we'll welcome this day in by welcoming God in. And uh, so his word can uh, dwell within us. So we're going to open up with our with a Psalm 97. Let's listen now for the word of the Lord. The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his adversaries on every side. His lightnings light up the world, the earth sees and trembles, the mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the peoples behold his glory. All worshippers of images are put to shame, those who make their boast in worthless idols. All gods bow down before him. Zion hears and is glad, and the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O God. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The Lord loves those who hate evil. He guards the lives of his faithful. He rescues them from the hands of the wicked. Light dawns for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. This opens up, um, Psalm 97 opens up. And I've been doing some reading on this, so uh, when I read this, I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, it talks about uh, clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Fire goes before him. Lightnings light up the world. This is um, this is reference to uh, the Shanaika. S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H. Or Shekinah, as some people say. Uh, glory. So remember that uh, when Moses went up uh, on the mountaintop, that there was always uh, clouds and lightning that were present. And, uh, we, and um, we also know that um, uh, we're told that in the first temple, that um, in the holiest of holies, which is where the ark was held, that there was a, um, a cloud. And it was the presence of that cloud that indicated, indicated God. Remember, Moses... Um, when Moses said, you know, I'd like to see you, God, and God said, nobody can see me. And uh, so he said, well, what I'm going to do, and so he actually, in Exodus, I think it's the 30, 33, somewhere in there, um, Moses has to uh, hide in the cleft of a rock with his face against the rock, and then the Lord passes by, and then um, Moses looks over, and he sees the back of God. Nobody, nobody can see God, right? And uh, and live, just as they say that, um, you know, nobody could touch the Ark of the Covenant and live either. So um, this uh, Shanika glory um, is is this cloud, uh, the, this holy and sacred cloud, which indicates the presence of God. All right. And then we're going to move on to Jeremiah. So this is Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 1 through 15. Now, Jeremiah has been going on for a while here that we haven't read, right? But um, so Jeremiah is a prophet. And again, prophets are uh, people that bring the word of the Lord. And, and, and we say that prophets are king makers and king breakers, right? They, um, so Jeremiah is in Jerusalem, uh, in Judah, and... Um, uh, he's in a little bit of trouble because the king, Jer Jerusalem is under siege by uh, the Babylonians, which is Nebuchadnezzar. And um, historically, we know that um, Israel, uh, Judah, Jerusalem, saw this threat coming from, um, from Babylon. And so they tried to get uh, Egypt, which was another empire to the south of them. Um, they tried to enter into a treaty with them so that they would protect them from, from this threat from the east. 
and um, Egypt actually moved troops up um, and then uh, thought better of it and moved back. So that allowed, so Nebuchadnezzar has laid siege and is not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a walled city. It's not in the city yet, but has completely surrounded it. And Jeremiah has made some prophecies that have uh, upset uh, um, Zedekiah, who is the king of Judah. So that's kind of the context here. It gets us going. So let's read the word of the Lord. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of King Zedekiah of Judah was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Ju Judah had confined him. Zedekiah had said, why do you prophesy and say, thus says the Lord, I am going to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. King Zedekiah of Judah shall not escape out of the hands of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And he shall take Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall remain until I attend to him, says the Lord. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. So I'm going to stop there for just a second. So he has prophesied against Judah and prophesied against Zedekiah. Zedekiah is not happy with it. Although the prophecy is coming true because uh, the Babylonian army is completely surrounded um, Jerusalem. And uh, but so what he's done is he's actually imprisoned him within the palace. Now, this wasn't like in a dungeon prison. This was. This was a house arrest. Um, so, uh, you know, just Zedekiah is just uh, uh, ignoring the obvious and, and the real. Um, but since uh, pride has said, well, if you're going to prophesy against me, I'm going to imprison you. All right, so we'll continue on. Verse 6. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Hanimal, son of your uncle Shalem, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanimal came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field that is in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the Lord, the word of the Lord. I'm going to stop there. So uh, while he's in prison, uh, his cousin right, uh, comes to him, and, and uh, Anathoth is the native town of Jeremiah, and it's about three miles away from Jerusalem, and what it is, is the law of Moses says that the right of uh, redemption says that uh, land is passed on, um, not freely, uh, but the title has to be given uh, an opportunity to purchase land before it can be conveyed um, to people within the family. So uh, Hanimal and his cousin has said, we have this piece of land. And, um, but God has come to Jeremiah and said he's going to do this, right? And so sure enough, he does. And uh, now think about this. The Babylonians have taken over everything except Jerusalem. So he's coming to him saying, buy this piece of land. I need the money, right? Um, it, and but it's worthless. Right? They don't even, it, Bab, Babylonians have just have taken over everything. So the land is worthless. Why would he want to pay money for this? Think about that. So we'll continue on. And I bought the field at Anathoth uh, from my cousin Hanimal and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, uh, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, Ma, Maesia, I'm sorry, in the presence of my cousin Hannibal, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase 
and this open D and put them in an earthenware jar in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, for houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought, brought, I'm sorry, bought in this land. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. So you have these two deeds. The, the basically says it's the one that says the closed one is the one that says I own this now, and the open one says that I have this ability um, to sell it. Um, and he says, look, uh, it goes to he says put these in an earthen jar. It's basically a time capsule, right? Nobody, everybody is saying everything's lost. Um, the Babylonians are at the gate. They've taken everything over. We're going to lose everything, but. Um, and in the presence of in the presence of all this, Jeremiah says, "Here, I'm going to spend. I'm going to spend money. I'm going to put this put this in a, put this in a time capsule because the Lord says that there will be a time when houses and fields and vineyards shall shall one day be bought and sold in the land. So there's there's freedom coming. So there we go. Long story, but important." All right, we'll go on to our New Testament reading, and we're still in Colossians, this letter from Paul. And um, chapter 3, verse 18, and we're going all the way into chapter 4, verse 18. And this is a little bit of a longer reading. Uh, Paul telling this church how they should act in his absence, I guess. And, and remember, Paul is writing at a time when he feels that the return of Christ is pretty eminent. So, here we go. Uh, uh, trigger warning here. There's, there's, some, there's some things here that might upset us, our, our modern day ears, okay. Wives, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is your acceptable duty in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, or they may lose heart. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever your task, put yourselves into it as, uh, as done for the Lord and not for your masters. Since you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you serve the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong has been done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, for you know that you also have a master in heaven. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert uh, in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us as well that God will open to us a door for the word that we may declare the mystery of Christ for which I am in prison so that I may reveal it clearly as I should. Conduct yourselves wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how, how you ought to answer everyone. Tychius will tell you all the news about me. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Unisius, uh, the faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will tell you ev about everything here. Uh, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, who, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, greets you. These are the only ones of the circumcision among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. He is also wrestling in his prayers on, on your behalf so that you may stand mature and fully assured in everything that God wills. For I testify for him that he has worked hard for you and for those in Lodotha, uh, uh, Lodosia and in uh, Heropolis, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Lodosia and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Lodosians 
and see that you read also the letter from Ladosha and say to Archippus, see that you complete the task that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. This is a, a, a wonderful section because it talks about uh, how Paul was working. And you've heard some names there. He's, he's uh, sending greetings from people that are with him. Also saying, hey, you might see some of these people because I send them to you. Um, and um, just telling them to be aware and to keep focused. And um, um, this, this particular passage in the beginning of it here, I said it was a trigger warning. And that is because this can be misrepresented um, by people if they want to, right? It says, wives be subject. The whole chapter 3, verse 18 is, wives be subject to your husbands as is fitting for the Lord. And then 19 says, husbands love your wives and never treat them harshly, right? If you want to, but there's some churches that say they'll only use that 18, right? Be subject to your husband. It's really saying, um, Paul is not advocating um, for a social structure that includes slavery and, and women to be subservient. He's just saying this is this is the way it is. But if it's going to be this way, let's make sure that we treat everybody fairly. And we and our ultimate master is Christ Jesus and that we answer to him. So that's the I think that's the most important thing that we take out of this. All right. Plus, it talks about all of these people, Mark, right? Um, and uh, we don't think that's necessarily Mark that wrote the gospel, but it's a, a Mark, it's John Mark. Um, and then we also see that, uh, you know, he's got uh, Luke, which is the Luke that writes. So all of those things. Uh, and we hear about him and we, and, and we have a, a real good um, evidence of who were some of the people. And Nymphia, Nympha, who is mentioned here, it says she has a church in her house. You know, that's a big thing because there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, it was just it's men only in the church. No, um, Paul talks about women that are critical uh, in his ministry. Uh, and here we have women that are that actually has churches, church in her house. So we can see that women were were uh, very important uh, and had positions of influence in the early church. All right. Gospel reading. Go to Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50. Story of Jesus. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that, that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman uh, this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. She gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. 
So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. Um, have a instance of Jesus' feet being washed and uh, expensive uh, uh, ointment uh, being put on them. We, we know the story of, uh, of uh, Martha, uh, and so perhaps this is, maybe it's a different one. Um, but we do know that uh, in the time of Christ, um, it was uh, common that when people came, it was a dusty place, right? There was no vacuums or anything. So when people came in, that um, the host would offer uh, foot washing. And um, so this Pharisee, this keeper of the law, whose name was Simon, um, invites Jesus to come and eat, and, uh, which was a reach, but he, his purpose was as they were trying to um, find out more about this threat, threatening person, Jesus. And then Jesus uses this as an opportunity to show, hey, uh, forgiveness is real. Um, and he makes this statement that says, well, uses the example of two people owe money and the people, person that he owes the money, that, that is owed the money forgives it. Who loves that person more? And so, well, the one that he gave, you know, the one that who was forgiven more money. So, um, this woman uh, is forgiven all of her sins, right? The Pharisee supposedly has no sin because he worked his whole life trying to make sure that he doesn't have sin. Um, so, it's a lesson for them. But then the other people at the table turn it around because. Jesus has now completed, has now uh, said something or done something blasphemous. He has forgiven sin, and only God can do that. So um, they've caught him on something. So here he is doing the work of the Lord, being God, and um, people are un unjustly um, accusing him. All right. Let's go back here and see how we're doing, everybody. You guys have conversations going on again. It's hard for me to catch up with these. Tracy Krotz, Corey Lockridge, Jamie Bowerman, if I didn't say hello, Joan Ring, I did do that. Okay, caught up that. Um, hush Mose. Sandy Sauerbeck, hello. Okay. Oh, yep. Yeah, we have ChristNet is going on, so we have uh, we're doing uh, food for that. And uh, Margo and Kevin and Barry and um, and uh, Chris uh, all worked with that. So hi, Gene Hartwig. Good to see you. Barbara Shoot. Good morning. Uh, all right. Amy needs pain for pain, please. Yes, Gene, Gene will do that. Okay, so uh, when we pray here, um, lots of prayers needed. Um, we're praying as a church family for the Stapleton family, who um, uh, Steve Sr. is in uh, really, really rough shape in the hospital. So we need to pray um, for Barb, for the whole Stapleton family, and they continue to have to battle COVID uh, throughout their family. So we need to do that. We'll pray for Amy uh, for pain relief, right? So we just need a lot of healing. We need healing in our in our lives. We need healing in the in the in the lives of the in, in the lives of the world. So uh, we'll start off this Monday, and that will be our plea. Our plea will be for healing today. Let's pray, Lord. We gather here and we thank you for the opportunities that you've given us to hear your word and then also to act on that. We thank you for the tremendous number of people who are volunteering for our ChristNet activities this year. It's different because we're not, we can't host them because of the pandemic, but they are in a safe place and we can still reach out and provide uh, food while they are in a safe shelter. So a lot of people have given of themselves and continue to give of themselves this week, and we thank you for that. Bless them, uh, bless their activities. Uh, let the people of ChristNet uh, see how much they are loved by people they've never even met. 
uh, by our offerings that we give them. And Lord, we pray for those who are sick and uh, those who face some really difficult times. So we pray for the Stapleton family. Uh, we pray for the entire family, for their strength, their comfort, for their healing. We pray for Jean's uh, uh, daughter, uh, Amy, uh, that uh, she might have uh, pain relief uh, from her recent procedure. Lord, you are the great physician. And uh, we ask for physical healings, but we also need emotional and spiritual healings as we face the realities of this world. And, uh, we know that there'll become a time where there'll be neither suffering nor sighing, but it's not here yet. And that means that we need to persevere through. Just as Jesus told that woman who was a sinner that her sins were forgiven. And it was her faith that had given her that forgiveness. So we turn to you in faith. God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and we ask that uh, that uh, healing occur, and that we be at ease with who we are in Jesus Christ, and that we move forward to shine that light to others. We ask all of this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, all. So I love you all, and uh, keep, uh, keep everybody in prayer. It's a it's a good day to be in prayer. And um, we will be back. Um, we will be back with you tomorrow at 9 a.m., all right? We'll talk to you later. God bless. Bye-bye.